I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to the sports world, but whenever football and basketball is canceled, you kind of become a fan of every sport. And one of the things that happened last week was the end of the U.S. Open, the tennis tournament. Today, we had the end of the U.S. Open golf tournament. But they did this tribute thing back to the 80s, and I don't know if any of y'all saw the stories or anything, but this guy by the name of Andre Agassi, how many of y'all remember him? He is one of the rare people who, although he played tennis, was able to go mainstream. Back in the day, he had this neon flash. Everybody kind of had this idea that even though he was a tennis player, and I get it, even though he played tennis, people wanted to dress like him, be like him, and he had this saying about himself. It was this, image is everything. It was on the EOS Rebel cameras that he did, all the commercials, everything else. And so what Nike did during the 2020 U.S. Open was they played tribute to him. And they had these people wearing outfits that looked ridiculous in the same way he did. And it just kind of brought back to life this idea of image is everything, at least in my brain. And I remember thinking through it and how... As a teenager, you wanted to make sure that you looked a certain way. I don't know, maybe some of you who are in your 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever are still trying to make sure you look right, do right, say right, and concerned about your image. And as we think and bring all this together, what I want us to do is kind of have an awareness that image may not be everything, but to some it is, and the image that we portray about ourselves kind of has a lot of consequences. One of the things in particular that we're going to talk about is the image or the reputation that you want to carry and conduct yourself with. What you want other people to think about you and kind of the framework of how that plays out in our daily lives. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that for some of us is easy and for some brings a lot of personal harm and regret and thought process that just burns and weighs you down. We're going to be talking about the idea of abortion or the topic of abortion. And what I want to do as we enter into this message and we dive into God's words is I want you to think about the image that a teenage girl would have if after she was with a boyfriend or at a party, she came home and over the next few days or weeks, she found out that she was pregnant. I want you to think about the image she would have of herself as she would have to talk to her parents as she would have to talk to her friends, and she would have to decide, am I going to stay in high school or drop out? Do I keep the baby or not keep the baby? How do we, do we think about this? Think about it from her perspective as we jump into the text. Now, the Bible's very clear about something as we look at Luke chapter 1. It shows that God is the author and perfecter of life. It shows throughout Scripture that God is intimately involved in the development of a baby, but it shows life in the womb. Luke chapter 1 gives us this beautiful picture, kind of by accident, of how life happens at conception, not at birth. Mary had been visited by an angel and told that not only was she pregnant, but Elizabeth was pregnant. And Luke chapter 1, we're actually going to start in verse 39, starts off and it says this. After she had the angel come and visit her, and the part of verse 39 says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. What you see in this picture is the baby in Elizabeth's womb was very alive. This baby was very aware. And before the baby was born, the baby had reactions. This speaks to the fact that before life happens, before birth happens, that babies actually have life. This is a framework for us to have a biblical understanding that not only did God create life, but he gives us the foundation for it. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. 
it goes to certain uh, verses that we can think of, like Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5 makes it very clear that, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. It gives us this biblical picture that God is intimately involved in the formation of every single person. It shows us that every single person is highly valued. They're highly valued because the Bible tells us that God's involved with it. Psalms 139 talks about this, that how God formed our inward parts. He knitted, together, knitted us together in our mother's womb. The psalmist says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. A biblical understanding doesn't just give us a picture that life happens at conception. It gives us a biblical picture that God's involved in every single detail of the formation of the baby. Whenever we think about this, there are certain things that science has taught us about the formation of the baby. From the baby development inside the mother's womb. At 19 days after conception, a baby's eyes begin to develop. At 24 days, the heart begins beating. At 30 days, the unborn baby is only one quarter of an inch long, yet he has a brain, eyes, ears, mouth, kidneys, and liver. At 35 days, the fingers are formed. At 40 days, brain waves can be detected and recorded. In the seventh week after conception, the baby begins to move spontaneously. In the tenth week, the baby squints, swallows, and hiccups. And I asked the ladies in the first service, how many of y'all can actually feel the hiccups of the baby? And they all raised their hand. At 10 weeks, he has fingerprints. He or she has fingerprints, which will stay for them for the rest of their life at 10 weeks, individually, uniquely made. In the 12th week, the baby responds to touch and begins to suck their thumb. By the fourth month, his ears are functioning. He can hear his mother's voice for the first time. In the seventh month, he or she can hear and taste and touch. He recognizes his mother's voice whenever he hears it, and by the ninth month, the baby weighs between six and nine pounds. His heart pumps 300 gallons of blood per day. He or she is fully capable of life outside the womb if only he is given it. Every single person is made unique by God. Every single baby is made special by God. Every single life is loved and valued by the creator of this universe. And as you think about that as it relates to you, you are not an accident. You may not have been planned, but you were not an accident. And every life has immeasurable value because every life was made by God. Every person is highly valued. And we need to understand the state in which we're born because every person is deeply fallen. Whenever we look at Psalms 51.5, it kind of speaks to the nature of our being, why we struggle with sin. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is the gift of Adam to everyone who has ever lived. Because of the sin of Adam, we are born with a sin nature. Everyone is born into sin through Adam. We have this natural tendency to rebel against God and to go our own way. Romans 5.12 says it this way, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We need to understand the, the framework of our sin nature. Because our sin nature not only causes us to rebel against God, our sin nature makes us do things that might be unthinkable or unimaginable. And as we think about sin, our tendency to do that sin becomes greater. And not only does the unimaginable become thinkable, the thinkable becomes done. And that's part of of the reason why abortion is a thing. Because we get caught 
and sin, and we think about it from our perspective. And by nature, we're all selfish. And by nature, we all are rebellious. Whenever we think about this topic, what I believe is we need to have more compassion and more understanding. I've never met a woman who introduced herself and right away said, oh yeah, and I've had four abortions. In fact, I've never met a woman in my entire life who whenever we get into the subject talks about it with pride. I've never met anyone who's been happy about an abortion. Shame and regret, hurt and heartache usually go with a woman for the rest of their life whenever they get into this. There's a woman by the name of Abby Johnson who was a director of a Planned Parenthood who kind of rose up the ranks, got their most prestigious award. And recently at a political event, she shared her story. And just because we don't want to get into politics, we have removed every trace of where she came from, although you can Google it. We're just not trying to get into politics this morning. I want you to listen as Abby Johnson tells how she moved from pro-choice to pro-life with just an experience she had. Later in August, my supervisor assigned me a new quota to meet, an abortion quota. I was expected to sell double the abortions performed the previous year. When I pushed back, underscoring Planned Parenthood's public-facing goal of decreasing abortions, I was reprimanded and told, Abortion is how we make our money. But the tipping point came a month later when a physician asked me to assist with an ultrasound guided abortion. Nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. An unborn baby fighting back, desperate to move away from the suction. And I'll never forget what the doctor said next. Beam me up, Scotty. The last thing I saw was a spine twirling around in the mother's womb before succumbing to the force of the suction. On October 6th, I left the clinic, looking back only to remember why I now advocate so passionately for life. It was observing and participating in an abortion. It was this director of an abortion clinic watching a baby fight literally for its life that caused her to change her career and her lifestyle and move from one who provided abortions to fighting against abortions. She saw it. If there were a possibility to show more of this today, she would hear how she talked about how she remembered the smell of abortion in the clinic. And she said, did you know abortion has a smell? The hopelessness of these women, the heartbreak as they come in and they don't just get rid of a baby, they create a scar in their life for the rest of their lives. The abortion... And I want to make sure we're as clear as possible. Abortion is wrong because it's the taking of an innocent life. Abortion is a sin because it allows a woman or a couple to play the role of God and decide who gets to live, live and who doesn't get to live. Abortion is wrong because it takes an innocent person and removes their possibility to, to live and breathe. Abortion is the deliberate, premature ending of a pregnancy by medical means, with the intended result being death of the unborn baby. Abortion has been legal in America since 1973 with Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion on January 22, 1973. The Supreme Court, by a vote of 7 to 2, legalized it. 
In doing so, they overturn the abortion laws of all 50 states, and it has been called one of the most radical decisions that was ever made. In his dissent, Justice Byron White called the majority decision an exercise in raw judicial power. When you look at the statistics since then, the total number of abortions from 1973 to 2018 was 61.8 million plus. There are 186 abortions to every 1,000 lives live births. That is 18% plus pregnancies end in an abortion. abortion. Abortions per day, over 2,300. That means that there are over 98 abortions every hour, one abortion every 96 seconds. When we look at this, the craziest thing in my brain is it just kind of become commonplace. We know and we hear and we see how politics will play into this. And what we understand today is that with the passing of RBG, the, the justice, Miss Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, which we don't celebrate, we don't celebrate the ending of anyone's life, there is for the first time in a long time a realistic possibility that abortion Roe v. Wade might be overturned. There is a possibility that maybe this act that has been legalized might become illegal. We, we don't know. But here's what I know. The whole mantra behind this in the pro-choice movement is my body, my choice. Man or government, states and laws and regulations from the pro-choice side, says that we can't tell a woman what to do with her own body. The problem with this is whenever you look at other things. We know that if a woman is strung out on drugs, that she will be arrested and we will make her become sober. We understand that if a woman tries to sell her body, if that is her choice, she will be arrested and not allowed to prostitute herself. We know that if a woman decides to injure her own body, she will be locked up and put in some kind of treatment facility until she no longer wants to hurt her body. The idea of my body, my choice, has never been true. And if COVID has taught us anything, we understand this. It's none of our bodies, none of our choices when it comes to the well-being of those around us. That's why the government in our state and pretty much every state in our union has mandated masks. Whenever you're in public, you have to be thoughtful of others. You wear a mask so as not to spread a disease because it's not your body, not your choice. And as we think about the consequences of COVID, we need to kind of think about it in terms of abortion. This year alone, there's been over 30 million deaths because of abortion. There have been less than 1 million deaths because of COVID-19 globally. When we think about the terms of this, it's not that we want to build up rage and hatred and animosity within anyone. We want to make sure that we understand the stakes here. We want to make sure that we understand the value of every person. Instead of cursing darkness, we want to shine light on the situation. In the midst of all the bad news, did you know that the generation coming up, which a lot of the boomers and older are complaining about and they're nervous about, did you know that the generation coming up now is the most pro-life generation in the history since we've, had, since we've had Roe v. Wade? And the thing that's so beautiful about it is it's science. It's the idea of ultrasounds and, and spreading light on the situation that is making the younger generations realize that life actually begins at conception. I don't want to be the kind of person who stands on a street corner and calls people baby murders. I don't have any interest in looking at a sin-fallen people and pointing my fingers at them and shouting to them how bad they are. It is not helpful. What I think every single person needs to know and understand is that they are greatly loved. 
Love more than they can comprehend. Love more than I can explain. There's a verse we all know, we know it well. It's probably the most popular verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's every single person that is loved. And what we see in this is that the ground level at the foot of the cross, or the the ground is level at the foot of the cross because we have all sinned, we have all fall short of the glory of God. It is our sinfulness that caused God to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He didn't come so he could condemn us. We stood condemned already. He came to give us a way out. And think about that idea that images everything. Can you imagine what it would feel like if your son or your daughter was part of an unplanned pregnancy in middle school or high school? Can you imagine what it would feel like if there was not even a desire or an attempt to do the act that would create a pregnancy and yet you found yourself pregnant? Think about the image that this young girl might feel as she bore not only her shame, but the shame of her parents and her grandparents. We have a woman in our church that I think is just about the sweetest person on the planet. She has been through hardship that you cannot even imagine or comprehend. And in her bravery, she shared part of her story at the Rockwall pregnancy dinner last year. And she sent it to me, and she told me I could share it. So I want y'all to watch this real quick. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. You have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. Hi, I'm Brenda Pittman. And God saved me when I was 16 years old. I was attacked and raped by an old boyfriend. And my mother had passed away when I was 13, so I went to my father and told him, and he sent me away to have an abortion. But I was too far along, so they put me in an unwed mother's home, and I placed my baby for adoption, and God saved me again and he also saved my baby. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. Let's see, Brenda. We don't think about it from the term or the mindset of the 16-year-old girl, and it's so much worse than what Brenda shared in that story. Because she did not have the abortion, she was kicked out of her home. Essentially excommunicated from her family. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of a situation more terrifying for a 16-year-old girl to have the only parent left in your life basically say, you're unwanted. But God has redeemed her story and her situation. And now she offers life and love and hope to those around her. And I think for us, what we need to do is offer the same love that we have received. It's why I refuse to pick it. I don't think moms are going to abortion clinics because they woke up and they thought, you know, on my list today, what I want to do is murder a baby. 
I think what most women who enter into those kind of clinics think is I have no other option. I have no choice. I don't know what else to do. I think many of them consider the life of the baby. And they think if this baby were to be born, they would be poor and destitute and have a terrible life for the rest of their life. And I just can't bear myself to allow that to happen. I think what they need to do is experience this love of God, which is greater than all of their sin. They need to realize that God loved them so much that he sent his own son to die for them. And as we look at the details of John 3.16, it's just immeasurably powerful for God, the greatest giver, so loved to the greatest degree, the world, the greatest company, right? You, me, everyone in it, that he gave the greatest sacrifice, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest opportunity believeth the greatest simplicity in him the greatest attraction should not perish the greatest promise but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty everlasting life the greatest possession. How can we who have received Christ share Christ with the world that desperately needs it? Instead of standing on a corner, pointing our finger at people, cursing the darkness, how can we combat this? How can we impact darkness with light? I think it happens when we communicate that every person is highly valued, every person is deeply fallen, but every person is greatly loved. This starts, I believe, by having an image of appreciation. I love the Rockwall Pregnancy Center. They're also in Mesquite. There's multiple sites. I don't know how that name works, though. The Prestonwood Pregnancy Center. So many different resource centers where moms can go in who are trying to think about what do I do in this situation? I think the greatest gift that happens is whenever a young mom can look and see the baby before the baby's born. Brenda and I were talking and she has a friend who is 25 years old and unwed pregnant. And Brenda said, before you have this abortion, just go get an ultrasound. Just go look and see. And so this young mom walked in and she had her ultrasound and the comment she had as she walked out is there's no way I can kill this baby. She saw. She appreciated the gift of life that was growing in her womb. The reason that we support the Rockwall Pregnancy Center, the reason that it's so easy for us to promote them and encourage other people to be a part of what we're doing and encourage our connect groups to go participate in their walks and their fundraisers is because they're shedding light on darkness. They have this really cool thing that has been developed recently. It's a, basically a bus, a, a, a mobile home, right, that they've transported into an ultrasound and they go from place to place to place and young, young moms or moms can go in there and they can see an image of their baby. They can go to the house and they can be safe and secure and they just get to appreciate the gift of life that is growing within them. Another thing that I think we need to do is we need to have an image of adoption. There is a great alternative to abortion, and it's adoption. I'm hopeful that within the Southern Baptist Convention, and I know that we've been working on this as a convention, I'm hopeful through legislation, and if we have people who value life in our government, that one day, I mean, can you imagine if it were just as easy to have an adoption as it was an abortion, can you imagine if it cost the same amount of money to adopt as it did to abort? I know there's a lot of ramification that goes with mom who gives up their child for adoption because I've seen it in my own family. My sister, when she was in high school, got pregnant. 
my sister had an adoption ceremony where she took that baby who if he would have been raised by her would have had little chance at all and she placed that baby in the hands of a mother and father who desperately wanted a child. And it's painful. It's probably the most emotional thing I've ever been a part of. But what if giving life was as affordable as taking life? Not only is there an image of adoption, there's this image of acceptance. A pastor friend of mine, my mentor, recently retired, one of my mentors. And while we were talking about his ministry and everything else, I said, all right, tell me your greatest successes, what are you most happy about, and tell me your greatest regret. The successes were hard for him. The regret was easy. He said that during his ministry, the worship pastor had a daughter who got pregnant in high school. He said the worst thing I ever did in my life was I drug that little girl up front and I made her apologize to the church. He goes, it was inhumane. She wasn't on staff. She already felt guilty. I should have never done it. He said, he can't tell me the number of times he's apologized to her. He goes, there's church discipline, and what I did was not that. It was not right. There was a, a saying at Prestonwood within the student ministry the student pastor, whenever I was there, talked about how they never had any teen pregnancies. I was like, you know what, I've, I've noticed that. And he goes, do you know why that is? And I was like, you do a good job? And he goes, no. These parents won't allow their children to be pregnant. They're still having sex. They're still getting pregnant. The reason the pastor created the pregnancy center is because he knew what was happening in the homes. I know for us, if we're going to be what God calls us to be, we've got to be a place of acceptance. We think about COVID, right? I don't know anybody who really enjoys wearing a mask. I don't know how many of you were excited to come to a new service, but we do it for the safety and the well-being of those around us. We created a third service, not because we didn't have space, we just didn't have space to socially distance. We did it out of kindness to create safety and security. It's my hope and my prayer as pastor of this place that we can become a safe place not only physically, but a safe place emotionally. Where if a young girl got pregnant, she wouldn't feel like she was always judged and condemned and looked down upon. To where if a single lady got pregnant, she wouldn't feel so ashamed of herself that she couldn't come to church anymore. We need the, to be the kind of place that is aware of our own sinfulness so that we don't point fingers at other people and the obvious sins that are so there when we deal with a mountain of sins in our own hearts and lives. We must be the perfect place for imperfect people to connect with God and others or we are not the church God called us to be. And it doesn't mean that we excuse sin, we will not. It doesn't mean that we accept sin or accommodate sin, we will not. It just means that when people come broken, we become a hospital for the hurting, a place of love, and we simply receive them in the same manner in which Jesus receives us. Just as they are. 
refusing to allow people to remain in a state of constant sin. I think the, the question for us is what are we going to reflect? Do we reflect judgment or love? For us, what we need so desperately is to have an image that reflects the image of God. Loving and kind, filled with grace and mercy. Firm. Understanding our own sinfulness. Calling people to repentance and allowing God to do what only He can do. Transform hearts and minds for the good of people and for His own glory. If you're in here, and you've never experienced the love of God, what we want to do today is we want to give you an opportunity, and it's whether you talk to me or if you talk to one of our other pastors, an opportunity to receive the love of Christ in your heart and your life. If you're in here and you need prayer, we want to be able to pray with you. I'm not naive. I know that there are women in here who have had an abortion and you are still trying to forgive yourself. I just want to remind you, when it comes to that sin or any other sin, you either believe what God says about you, that you're loved, you're valued, and you stand forgiven, or you believe the lies in your mind that just beat you down into secrecy and shame. If you need someone to pray with you, if you want to pray at the altar, that is available to you. Maybe you're sitting in here and what you really want, what you need, is to be a part of a church that is doing everything we can to reflect the love and image of Christ. Maybe what you need to do today is you need to join First Baptist Rail Ed. I'm going to pray, and we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to God's word this morning.